What's going on, everybody? I hope everyone is having a fantastic Thursday night. We're almost there to the weekend, and we're bringing you back with some amazing content on tonight's show. I know Ross is really pumped up to introduce our next guest. So, Ross, why don't you kick it off and introduce uh, our guest for tonight's show? We have got the head coach from Lake Gibson, Keith Bearfield, is here to talk with us about Cristobal showing up and doing his speech and, and just some Lake Gibson football information in general. What's going on, Coach Bearfield? Hey, what's going on, guys? Thanks for having me, by the way. This is awesome. Absolutely, man. It's always a pleasure, you know, to have high school head football coaches on the scoop. We have a lot of recruits, NFL players. We do it all here, Coach exactly. Bearfield. But, um, you know, to have the head man at Lake Gibson High School, that's that's definitely an honor. Um, I, I got to ask Coach Bearfield, I mean, it's I feel like it's not very common for head football coaches at elite power five programs to go to high school, speak in front of the public. I mean, how did this event kind of occur for Mario Crisball to come over to Lake Gibson and, you know, and speak to everyone who was able to attend? Yeah. So uh, one kind of thing about my history as a coach is I've been a college coach up until this past year. Um, as a matter of fact, the day of our banquet, I was checking my notes from a year ago was the exact day from a year before when I accepted the job at Lake Gibson. Um, so I'm officially a high school coach for a year now. Um, and kind of the thing that I've brought, I've been trying to bring to the team and to the culture of Lake Gibson is we're going to do things different. We're going to up the level. A core value of ours is excellence and excellence to me means when you think you've got the best idea, push further. Right. And um, they've kind of been doing their banquet in the cafeteria and I didn't want to do that. And so we found a good venue, we found a good place. And I've been searching the rules to see if we could bring a college coach to come speak, kind of get some buzz for the banquet. And uh, so the last college I was at was the University of Louisiana with Billy Napier. Okay. And, um, and then I saw he decided to speak at a rival school's banquet in town. And that kind of, that peeved me a little bit. Um, and kind of to Crystal Ball's credit, at that time when I was upset, I was like, all right, who's going to do it for us? And and the two times that I've met with Crystal Ball before that, we built such a relationship in that short amount of time. I sent him a text right away, and he replied right away, let's do it, man. So that's how it happened. No, that's awesome. You know, like you said, a rival school had Billy Napier at the University yeah. of Florida. Why not reach out to Mario Crispo yeah. and you can talk at your school? That, that's that's very cool. That's awesome. What, what were the things he touched up on that stood out to you? Um, you know, from a Power Five coach winning the Rose Bowl at Oregon and the amount of experience he's had at the Power Five level as a head coach. Yeah, I think the the overall message was he was talking about, you know, kind of seeing where we're at in this banquet and then where we wanted to be next year's banquet, right? What did we want to be celebrating in the next year's banquet? Um one of the best things he kind of brought up was it was at that time 171 days. He did the math himself um, until our first game. And he said, now, the only thing that's going to make a difference in that 171 days is what we do with those days. And then all of our preparation, if we decide to skip reps, that's going to contribute to, you know, what we celebrate a year from now. And so I think kind of hitting home on those, uh, I guess, main points that, you know, I've been trying to make, my staff's been trying to make to the team. Sometimes the players, it kind of goes mute to them. But whenever you have a guy like Coach Cristobal come in and he's hammering home the same exact things to these guys and, and putting it in his terms and in his way, um, the more you can get that message out to the guys, the more that they start taking it seriously. And, um, you know, a couple of things that he said, like how you do anything is how you do everything. And immediately the next day we had two guys walk in late to a to, into the weight room and i said hey do we do we want a culture of you know almost or close enough to being on time right because we were close enough to a state championship this past year we got to the semifinals are we okay with that if so then we're not going to punish anybody right and our team's like no like we want to win it i was like all right well, when we get a penalty, the whole team moves back. So let's all get down and do squat jumps. So um, when when you have Crystal Ball backing you up like that, it kind of it makes it easier to, to drive home the point the next day for sure. You know, Coach, you've had a chance to meet Crystal Ball a couple of times. You said, what do you think makes him so relatable to recruits? Because we know that guy can yeah. recruit his ass off. <laughs> and you're absolutely right about that. So um, another 
uh, I kind of hit this uh, at the banquet myself when it was my turn to speak, but one of my favorite things as a career college guy, being a high school head coach now and watching all these recruiters come through the door and, you know, give their spiel and, and do what they do, I've been able to kind of observe and, and mark the differences between a good recruiter, a bad recruiter, and an elite recruiter, mm -hmm. right? And so um, <clears throat> to me, the biggest difference is I know why you're there. I know you're there to get like, there's no hidden agenda. You can act like it's hidden, right? But if you're going to be fake, like everybody's going to see it right away. And I don't think the best recruiters, what they do is they come in there and they're home right away. It's somebody you can relate to, somebody you want to hang out with, right? To put it in certain terms, it's somebody you want to go have a beer with afterwards, right? Um, and you know, to me, that's kind of a life lesson for anybody is when you want to get hired, people hire who they want to hang out with, right? When you're recruiting, kids are going to go where they want to hang out with the coaches, right? And I had an idea of who Cristobal was before I met him. And to me, he was more of this big imposing figure who's smash mouth football. And he's going to come in there and give me the, the hoorah speech. Um, but he was absolutely completely different than what I ever thought. So he's a funny guy. He's, he can relate to anybody who walks through the door and I didn't want him to leave when he showed up, right? We went down to Miami with uh, <clears throat> with Cormani and some of our guys uh, for that lead junior day. And we got up there into his office and I didn't want to leave his office that time either. And so when you go back to why I asked Cristobal, right? Like, yeah, it was my guy. I was upset at Coach Napier, but that was the reason that Cristobal was the first one to come to my mind because I wanted to hang out with him. Right. Nick Saban walked in my office. I didn't call Nick Saban first. Right. You know, you know, I had multiple head coaches walk in my office. I didn't call them. The first one that came to mind was Cristobal. And he said yes. And I didn't have a second thought after that. And so I think to me, that's what makes him an elite recruiter. You know, being a local head coach and in Miami having a new staff now, what's your opinion on this new staff at Miami? What have you been able to gather so far? Well, I thought Coach Adai was a huge, huge hire. Yes. Um, to me, that was uh, when I, because, you know, when you look at this race for Cormani, right, like Adai was the one pulling him the most to Georgia. And whenever he went, cause I like Adai too. He, to me, he was one of those elite recruiters that walked through. And then whenever I saw he was at Miami now, I, I kind of gave Coach Cristobal a tip of the hat and was like, that was big. That was big time. Um, you know, you think of guys like Charlie Strong on the staff, a guy with head coach experience, big time head coach experience. You think of Jason Taylor. I think even Ed Reed's like an analyst, right? Something like that. Like he's got all these big name guys down there and you know, they're gelling together as a staff. You can kind of see it when you're down there, whenever Chris the Ball's mixing with the staff. And I think he's putting together an elite group of guys who not only know football, not only know how to recruit, but they know Miami football. Right. And I think that's the biggest point to it is they know that Miami culture they're trying to get to. And that's what's going to help them out. Coach Bearfield, you know, previously, first 10 minutes in, you mentioned Billy Napier, Nick Saban, Mario Cristobal, three head coaches representing some elite programs in college football, hands down, outstanding football programs as a leader of young men. What do you what do you tell? I mean, all these talented players that we were talking about off air before we came on live, you know what to look for in the recruiting process because everyone's trying to sell you their program. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, but not everyone I feel like is you know they everybody wants you, but how do you decipher? You know, who's being genuine, who really wants you, or who's just going because you're you're one of the best players in the nation. You're talented, mm -hmm. and they just want you in the program. I mean, what 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 are you preaching to um, your football players to look for when they want to play at the next level? I think the first thing, and that's, a, that's probably the question, by the way. Um, it's a huge question. It's an important question to be able to answer. Um, and I think the first thing I tell them is, you know, outside of the head coach, look at your position coach. Because when it comes down to it, when you get there, your position coach is the guy you're hanging out with the most, right? You need... You need to be able to not only just get along with them, but is he the type of coach you want to be with? Um, 
I think the best recruiting tool for the kids is going up in the summer and doing that one-on-one -on -one individual workout with the position coach. Because now you can see how he coaches in his environment and you're almost recruiting him now, you know, seeing if he's the type of person you want to be with. Um, and then I think the other most important advice that I, I've given, in my opinion, is go to the place to where if football wasn't part of the equation, you'd still want to be there. Right. If you're going just for football, you're going just for one thing, you might be unhappy with the rest of life and that's going to ruin everything. You know, if you're happy at the University of Miami because it's the University of Miami, then it's also got a great football team, great coaches. That's gravy. That's where you're going to stay. Right. Um, you know, you talk about the elite head coaches. You got to think of why they're the elite head coaches. Right. Um, what got them there? Like, are they going to stay? Are they looking for the next step? And, you know, past behavior is the best predictor for future behavior. Um, you think of you know, Nick Saban's been there. I think he's going to stay there. Mario Cristobal, he's home. That's where he wants to be, right? Um, and, and those are things that you just kind of try to, you know, uh, tell the kids and kind of get them to understand. But at the end of the day, it comes down to, you know, where their heart is more than anything, and they need to trust their gut. I'll give you an example without mentioning the school's name of uh, Jalen Glover from last year, who's at Utah now. Um, he got plucked away from the state of Florida all the way to Utah because he got treated like family out there more than anywhere else. And one of his dream schools who was nearby um, offered him late. And he came up to me and said, coach, it feels like I'm an afterthought. It feels like I'm their second choice. And I go, Jalen, trust your gut. Like, I'm not gonna tell you that's how they feel, that's the truth. I go, but trust your gut. Because if you feel that way, you feel that way for a reason. And I think he made the right decision in that case. Coach, what were some big games last season for Lake Gibson that you felt really improved your team, you know, really took you guys to another level? Because, you know, competition breeds mm -hmm. greatness. That's right. Um, well, the, there's two games that stick out in my mind, and anybody who knows anything about me and Lake Gibson knows exactly which two games I'm talking about is we got to beat that other team in town twice this past year. Uh, they hadn't beat them since 95, never beat them at our home stadium before, and we got to do it twice this year. And that definitely set the legacy for the seniors, and it set us up for the future at Lake Gibson. Um, we don't say the L word at our school. Um, we don't wear the color orange. As a matter of fact, my notes to Cristobal coming up was don't wear orange, wear green or black. Um, <laughs> And I thought that was, that's probably the biggest, you know, highlights of, of the season for me anyway. Um, but you go back to before those two games and we played Lowndes on ESPN, a Georgia team on ESPN. And we lost that game of something like 58, 47, but it was an early test. It showed us that we could hang and it showed us that we can be beat. And I think that having that experience in big games like that is definitely what set us up down the road for games like against the L word across town, for games like, you know, Edgewater in the second round of the playoffs. And <clears throat> those were those were big tests in my mind. And you know, I felt like I felt like we still underachieved. I felt like we should have won the semifinal game, you know, if we could have it back, but that's why you play the games and they're not one on paper. But you know, definitely lit a fire under us to get after it this year and and set up some big games early, which is the biggest lesson I learned after this season. You know, it's uh, great that you mentioned Lowndes there because that's actually where the current 2022 right. for Miami's and quarterback. I will, I will say this about that kid. And I don't usually talk about my game planning um, publicly, but I will say this is I knew he was a great quarterback going into the game. I was talking with my D coordinator, over the summer, we, we started scouting that game over the summer. And I said, I think he's got a beautiful ball, but I don't think he's accurate on the deep ball. So stop him from running, right? Shut down the short game, make him throw it deep. And by God, he did. And he beat us doing that. So <laughs> kudos to him. I was dead wrong on that scouting report. Coach, I'm kind of curious, what's your method for determining the captains on your team? 
Um, it, it's a week to week basis, actually. Okay. Um, yeah, you always talk about going one and zero, and you know it's only this game that matters. And so it's the guys who kind of outwork the rest of them that week, you know, and the guys who show up as the main leaders, the main focus guys that week, and who earned it and deserved it that week. Um, you know, and it doesn't even matter how old you are in our system. We'll put a junior sophomore out there. Uh, leadership doesn't know age. If you're leading, you're leading. Coach Bearfield, everybody knows Cormani McLean. He's a household yeah. name if you follow high school football. 24-7 sports has him projected as a first-round pick, believe it or not. Yeah. Hasn't even played college football yet. Compared him to Greedy Williams, another first-round pick. Here's the difference between 24-7 sports. They're not their head coach. They're not Cormani's head coach. They don't see him every day. You coach him 24-7. You see him every day. That's right. Tell us about Cormani McLean, who he has, who he is as a player, why is he so special, and as a person as well. And I think I think he's getting all this attention, um, and it's definitely earned and, and deserved by him. But he's got the tangibles, like I, the measurables. He's tall, he's lengthy, he's quick, and he makes those plays. And he's got the God-given ability and the and the competitiveness. The thing though, that most people don't get to see that makes Cormani, Cormani, right? And what I mean by that is, I think he's the one of the few who's a consensus top 10 player by all the recruiting sites, right? Um, some of it's a popularity contest, some of it's political, um, it seems like. But at the end of the day, to me, what makes Cormani, I think he's the best player in the country, is he's an elite competitor. Um, He's got the mind for it. He wants to compete at any given moment. Now, what I mean by that is the first experience I ever had with him, I kind of took the offense out there a year ago just to kind of see what I had working with him. Did like a little OTA, if you will. And afterwards, they wanted to do one-on-one, -on -one, so I kind of sat back and watched. It was Cormani versus anybody who wanted to run a route. Like, there was no other defensive player out there in the one-on-ones. Kormani went, he came back up, lined up again, went again, and he gave everybody his best. If I went out there, if Randy Moss went out there, you're going to get the same Kormani every single time. And this is, this is not embellishing <laughs> at all. Anytime you might think Kormani's having a down day where he's just not excited about whatever, as soon as he sees a ball in a field, there's something that changes in his eyes. Something lights up inside of him and he goes 100% of the time. And if you ever need him to do something for you, just say you can't do seven on seven until, and that's going to get done immediately. Like the kid loves ball. He will play anybody, anytime, anywhere. If I said, let's go, he said, let's go. And so um, as a matter of fact, one of my favorite things about Cormani is about three times this year it happened pregame. He walked up to me and said, this is who we playing? I'm like, yeah, Cormani, this is who we playing. He goes, oh, we got these guys. And I mean, his confidence has kind of made me stand up a little tall. I'm like, let's go then, dude. And so whenever he's on, the rest of us are on. And there's nothing else in the world like it. He's the ultimate competitor. And... Right now, he's a little skinny, and I know one year on that meal plan, he's going to come back to Lake Gibson, and I'm going to be pissed off as I'll get out because I'm going to see how beautiful he looks at that point. Just wish he'd have been like that here. So, We actually, uh, Coach Barefield, have a good question from one of the viewers watching. He asks, as a high school football coach, how do you keep some of your players' ego in check in this modern social media era? You know, we spoke about a lot of elite players you have off air. Um, everyone tells them they're great over and over again. They're young men. I mean, everyone's, I'm sure, thinking they're the best. I mean, how do you humble your players and make sure they work extra hard? Yeah. Um, well, to me, ball don't lie, right? Like, if you're out there uh, you know, and you're getting beat by somebody who shouldn't beat you, it's because you're starting to get overconfident and – letting it get to your head, number one. Number two, at Lake Gibson, we have the, um, you know, the, the gift of having more than one four or five star on our team. 
you know, last year we had Sam McCall versus Cormani every single day in practice, right? So if they were off a little bit, the other five star was going to hand it to them, right? Um, you know, we have Brayshawn who's coming up behind Cormani, right? And so whenever Cormani's at receiver, he could show Brayshawn, look, you get a little too confident, this is what's going to happen. I think that's something that most teams don't have. Um, but I'm a big proponent of – I read our players' Twitters and Instagram, and we kind of live in the day and age where they like to post like a 30-second snippet of a workout and then say how hard they work. And as soon as that work ethic drops in front of me, I will quote their tweet right back at them and tell them that they're a liar. And so that's how I do it. Now, that might not be politically correct, but that's how we do it at Lake Gibson. That's what they respond to. You know, you mentioned a player, uh, Brayshawn Williams. Could you kind of let our fans know what's special about him as well? He's a 2024 kid, but he's got yeah. very, very high upside. Yeah, I think he's uh, he's almost just like Cormani in, in almost every sense of it, except he's not quite as long. Um, now, I think he, he rolls out of his hips, and he can hit you a lot harder, and he's not afraid to. I think the the best thing about Brayshawn is he's, he's kind of – he's our young pup, so – we had Sam McCall come through, and he's he's already gone. We got Cormani coming right underneath him. Brayshawn was a sophomore this past year. He started every single game and had more pass breakups than anybody else on the team. Wow. And we had a power five defensive backfield, right? We had, a, you know, we had Sam McCall, who's at Forest State. We had Javante McClendon, who was uh, committed to South Carolina. We had Cormani back there, and then the <laughs> then we had Dion. Deion Villiers, who's going to Tennessee State, and then little Brayshawn, who's just a sophomore, amongst all of them, have more pass breakups than anybody else. As a matter of fact, like, you know, Cormani broke the interception record again, but some of those interceptions were Brayshawn batting the ball to him. Um, and when you see Brayshawn roll out of his hips and he strikes you, he hits you hard. And I think that's what really jumped off of, a, off of his highlight tape that kind of really started getting him offers right away. As a matter of fact, it only took Georgia, a Georgia recruiter, about one minute of watching his film to pull an offer on him uh, this past spring. So he's he's an exciting guy to, to look forward to because he's not only good in, in pass coverage, but he'll make you pay. What's the vibe and energy that you want to have at your practices? Is there is there a specific, you know, is it? Is it kind of based off of the team you're going to play that week? Or is there always a consistent vibe and energy you want to have? Yeah, no, there's there's a consistent vibe and energy because it doesn't matter who we're playing. We're always competing against us, right? I know that's starting to become cliche, but I think the closer you get to being better than you were last week helps. But we want, we want every practice to compete, right? Um, as a matter of fact, my guys get mad at me whenever I have too much uh, walkthrough stuff or – uh, you know, install periods, like coach, let's do a competition period, right? And anytime we can start competing, you see the level of our play rise um, to a new level. And I think that's actually, that's something that was here before me and something that I've definitely um, embraced since I got here was, you know, at first I thought it was too much competition periods in practice, this, that, and the other. But then I realized like, that's what our guys thrive off of. They love to compete, you know, with the lights turn on on Friday, like they rise up to it. And so the more you can make it feel like Friday night, you know, at practice, we're kind of put one guy versus the other and the whole team watching the more juice we get and the more we're bouncing around at practice. And so uh, to me, that's exactly what I look for when we're competing, we're getting things done. Any other players that for the viewers watching should keep their eye out for this upcoming season at Lake Gibson that uh, are just as talented as the previous players we've been speaking about? Yeah, so um, Janoris Wilson, he's our offensive lineman who um, we felt like really upped his game a ton just this past season. He finally, we uh, our line coach put a lot of work into him and, and as far as his his technicality at the position that we put a lot of work into him in the weight room. He started wrestling this off season and he started getting power five offers, SEC offers, ACC offers here left and right. And I know the university of Miami is, is close to pulling the trigger on him. And he's about six, five, uh, 280 right now. He just got done with wrestling. So, um, 
we're excited to see him develop even more. He's got a huge, huge upside. Um, and wherever he lands, they're going to get an incredible person, too. Um, he owns his own cupcake business, which is incredible, right? Um, and the cupcakes are incredible. And um, as a matter of fact, for wrestling, he had to lose 20 pounds. So to talk about the kid's discipline, he's an offensive lineman who weighed over 300 pounds, had to lose 20 pounds while owning the cupcake business, and he did it, right? And so um, that speaks for itself. And, you know, we have Jacoby Fowler, who's going to be our running back this year, who just moved in. He's had got a few Power 5 offers. Um, we're excited to see what he develops into, if he pops something even bigger as we go along. And then you go back to our 24 class, our 24 class, is, you know, 23 class is good, is really good, you know, especially with Cormani in there, right? Our 24 class is just as good, but there's more kids, right? And so you have Brayshawn, you have Jamar Taylor, who's a receiver. He's a big receiver, um, almost big enough for me to think about putting him at that H-back tight end spot, but you know how kids can be whenever you say that, so I got to got to find a way to word it to where he's okay with it. Um, but he's a big outside receiver for us, and he's already popped like a West Virginia offer, um, UCF, USF, those schools. And we're excited to see where he ends up uh, developing into. And we got, I think the biggest sleeper out of all of them is Wade Tyre. Now, he's a smaller guy. He played outside linebacker for us, kind of a strong safety type. But he broke – our single season sack record. And I think in the playoffs alone, he had 11 sacks. And if you watch our highlight tape from the year, you see him almost on every single defensive clip he's in there. And he was just a sophomore this year to the point where people come up to me and they're like, man, how are you going to replace Wade? I'm like, what do you mean? They go, he's, he's graduating, right? I'm like, no, sir. We get him two more years. So um, I think as soon as he starts, filling in a little bit, that's when the offers are going to come his way. Pretty impressive, man. I'm telling you, Lake Gibson, look out for them. That's right. Seems like the expectation is state title or it's a failure. Should be yeah. like that every year. No, it's, um, and I think our kids have that mentality, right? I, I don't, it's hard to, you yeah. you want the state championship. That's exactly what we're gunning for. You know, I came from a high school, um, that won state championships in Louisiana year in and year out. And I've been a part of teams who didn't have that winning culture and they're almost afraid of saying win state. And here it's, you know, if we, anything short of that, we did something wrong, right? It wasn't that, you know, we just ran into teams that we couldn't beat, right? They might be more athletic, but we could still beat them, right? It, we know that if we do what we're supposed to do day in and day out consistently, Right, you go back to Cristobal, that next 171 days, then we should be unstoppable. You know, Coach, you mentioned a little bit earlier, you mentioned big games and wanting to play them earlier in the season. Is that something you guys were able to get set up for this this upcoming season? Okay. Um, it's been tricky this offseason with the whole Metro Suburban. We didn't know what that was going to look like at first. And then the realigning of the district. So the whole schedule has kind of been rocky of, getting it set up. Um, so I, I will say one thing, Lowndes didn't want to play us again, but um, yeah, I don't know if they had enough openings on their schedule, but we definitely tried to get that to happen. I'm looking for an ESPN game. There are talks of two different games and we might do them both if we have room on the schedule. Um, you know, I know Miami Central has reached out to us and and we've received that call and we're in that conversation. And I think if we can, especially if we can get ESPN to come in and give us a little boost for the money on that, then I think that'll happen. Cause I mean, especially with the Metro suburban split, like that's, a, that only makes sense to play that game. You know, I'm kind of curious here, coach, what coaches made a big impact in your life? Who are some of the guys that you truly remember that really, you know, set the tone for you and maybe even yeah. made you want to become a coach yourself? Yeah, so my dad was, was was a football coach. He was a small college head football coach my entire life. Um, and as a matter of fact, when I was 12 years old, I felt the calling to be a head football coach. And I told my dad that's what I was going to do with my life. 
and he told me two different things um, that day when I was, I was 12. I met, almost to the day, I can tell you, when the, it was August of 2001, right? One month before 9-11. And I, I told him that and he looked at me and said, are you sure? I was like, well, well I was sure until you asked me that. Um, and then he said, if you want to be a co or he said, if you can do anything else in this life and be happy doing it, go do that. He goes, but if you can't find anything else, then you have to be a coach. And I think what he was telling me is it's a rough business, but if you love it and you dive in head first, you'll survive. But if you're kind of halfway in, halfway out, you're never going to survive as a coach. Um, and so I took that seriously. And the other thing he said was, he said, there was a secret to being a great head coach. And he goes, you want me to tell you the secret? You want to find out like I did and find out on my own. And so I told him, I was, I'll find out on my own. And it's a little embarrassing to say it took me 17 years to realize I might have found this secret, but it's not like a fairy tale where you come across the secret and then the words on the page jump out at you. The room gets dark, bright light shines down and God says, this is the secret your dad was talking about. Right. Um, and so I was like, man, I better ask my dad what that secret was before he dies. Um, and so I not that he was, but just in case. Right. And so I called him and I said, dad, what was that secret? He goes, oh, well, to be a great coach, you got to have great players. Right. And and so, I, you know, it's kind of like what Jimmy Johnson said. Um, the reason he's in the Hall of Fame is because of great players and great coaches around him. And if that's an indicator of being a Hall of Fame coach, then nobody's been set up better in their first year than I have um, with the coaches and the players that I've had around me. And so my dad was definitely a huge influence. It still is to this day. I always go back to him whenever I have questions. Um, <clears throat> Coach Napier was actually a really big influence. Um, he's got the Saban way down, right? That whole process down, right? I think Chris Ball comes from the same cloth a little bit. And watching the way that he details out his day, um, I don't know if he'll be upset at me telling the secret, but every single day he maps out every 15 minutes what he's doing that day. And when he maps it out, he goes back to the two, three years previous of what he did on that exact day and has notes from those days to decide what he's going to do that day. And then at the end of the day, he writes what he wants to do next year. Right. And so um, one thing he let me do when I was there at Louisiana is I would <clears throat> almost like a library, check out his notebooks from his Alabama days and just read through them like they were books, right? And so it kind of taught me, all right, this is how detailed you can be, right? I thought I was detailed before. Now I'm like, oh, well, I'm not even close to being as detailed as he is. And so that's impacted me a ton. And when I go back into my career besides those two, it's really the first head coach I worked for, Coach Nick Bobeck at Central Oklahoma. I remember I learned more in that one year, that first year as a head coach, just how to be a leader, um, you know, how to run a team and how to, he was a, it was his first year there. And I just, every time I go back to lessons I've learned as a coach, you know, 80% of them come from that one year underneath him. And so those were definitely the biggest three coaches in my life. Well, Coach Bearfield, man, I mean, you've been outstanding throughout this entire show, uh, extremely informative and just the stories you, you just gave us just now and speaking about your players so highly, we can tell you really care uh, about the impact you're making at you know the football level for these young men. And I think you're doing an outstanding job. I think your father should be very proud of you for what Thank you've accomplished. You. I, I, I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Absolutely. Ross, you got anything else for Coach Bearfield before we let him go? Yeah, I got something here for you, Coach. When your seniors graduate, what do you want them to take with them into the next steps in life? You know, what, what can they take from football yeah. at Lake Gibson and apply it to their future? So here, this is honestly my hope and my prayer every single day as, as a head coach, because a lot of the times I'm the bad guy in their eyes. As, I'm, you know, I'm counterculture to what they're seeing everywhere else in their life. I'm saying some hard truths. I'm, you know, I'm making them all do a punishment for one guy being late to the weight room. Um, you know, I remember the first time I did team punishment here a year ago and the whole team looked at me that they were about to jump me for it. 
um, when they leave Blake Gibson and they get to where they're going, playing at the next level or what have you, I honestly want them to look back and say, that's what Coach Bearfield was talking about. That's why he did that. And, you know, I was pissed at him, but now I'm thankful for it. Um, it Cause that I'd rather them be mad at me now than mad at me later, I guess. You know, I don't, I don't want them to get to college and go, why didn't Coach Bearfield warn us about this or prepare me for this or coach us this way so we could have more success. I want them to get there and say, that's exactly what he's been preparing us for, and I'm thankful for it. I just got one more question for you, Coach, and this is actually a question that I ask every single recruit that we bring on here, and I haven't asked a coach this yet. Nice. Why do you love the game of football? Because it's a microcosm of life to me. Um, you, know, you go through ups and downs. There is adversity. And it's almost like I say in every single game. I've never left a game and said the referee's got every call right. So I know I'm going to be pissed at the referee at some point throughout the night. And it's being able to overcome what comes at you uh, throughout a game and throughout a season and with the team. And it's the relationships that make it more than the game, right? If, if you take the team aspect, the relationship aspect out of it, then we're just playing chess. That's all we're doing, playing checkers. And there's no emotion into it. And it's the ultimate team sport to where all 11 are relying on all 11 on the field. Right, one guy goes wrong, then the whole thing goes wrong. Um, and I think whenever you leave the game of football or you, you're done playing the sport and you have that team aspect, it's prepared you for life. And I think Nick Saban talked about it in an interview one time when he was at LSU that you get a stadium full of people pulling for one outcome, right? Everybody working together for that. And especially this day and age, or it doesn't matter what color skin you have, where you come from, how much money you have, how much money you don't have, but we're all pulling for the same thing, working together for it and achieving it together. Like that's, that to me is what we're trying to get our world to, right? And I think that's what makes football more special than any other sport in the world. Well, Coach Bearfield, once again, man, it was really an honor and a pleasure to have you come on the scoop. And we're going to be rooting for Lake Gibson to win a state title. And whoever you play on yeah. ESPN or, you know, we'll be more than happy to watch that game and root for you guys. So we're going to be pulling for you guys hard this upcoming season, no doubt. Absolutely. Yeah. No, when I get down to Miami and call you guys up, I'm coming to for spring ball a little bit, too. OK. We'll, oh, yeah. yeah. I'll we'll be, be back on the show with some with some recruits and. See if I can get Cormani out of his turtle shell to come talk to y'all too. <laughs> hey, sounds like a plan, Coach Bearfield. Hey, thank you so much again for coming on the scoop. Uh, we greatly appreciate it, and best of luck this upcoming season. Yes, sir. Thank y'all. You got it. Take care. Yep. All right, guys. That was Coach Bearfield, head football coach at Lake Gibson Senior High School. That interview got me fired up, Ross. I'm not going to lie. Tremendous uh, – football coach and uh, I think he's a great person as well leading young men you know just think about what we heard there imagine what he's like when he's in the locker room and the energy and the vibes going on game day just imagine what coach is like I'm sure it's very contagious dude I, I had a great time listening to him talk and a great time just kind of learning about his background in football what he felt was important and what he wants to bring to Lake Gibson no it's it was definitely a very very uh, insightful interview and I'm just glad he's uh, he's built a great relationship with the University of Miami coaching staff and with other coaches in college football as well. It was very interesting to find out that he, you know, was kind of from the Napier tree a little bit. He's familiar yeah. with him and he knows quite a bit about his background, actually. Um, you, you know, you talk when we talked with him, he always seemed to mention, you know, the Sabins of the world, Cristobal's. You know, he kept bringing up the biggest and best schools. And that just kind of tells me that he's got his eyes set on the biggest and best things. He's not settling for less. So if he's paying attention to the biggest and best in college, it's going to what? what he, that's what he wants for his high school team as well. He wants to schedule Miami Central Senior High School. He wants to play the best on ESPN. So yep. you got to love it. Well, guys, thank you everyone so much for tuning in tonight. We're always going to come out with weekly shows uh, covering Miami Hurricanes football. We're going to do a weekend show covering the coaching staff. By the way, Coach Field, it hasn't been official yet. The article was deleted on social media, so he has not been named tight ends coach. Jason Taylor has been added as an off-the-field, I guess, analyst role. He's a Hall of Fame NFL player. 
love to have him on board. And we got Rod White, co-DC of University of Texas, San Antonio. Yeah. Yep. So we'll be back at you covering the entire coaching staff with the new addition uh, coming up to the program in a couple days from now. So stay tuned for that. And always, all about the U. Go Canes. Go Canes. Go Canes.